co-hosted by the EU delegation and the permanent missions of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Singapore, Kenya, and Finland. I'm Jocelyn Blériot. I'm the executive lead for institution, governments, and cities at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, an organization whose mission is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And I'm particularly delighted to be moderating this session today because we have been doing a lot of work on the post-COVID recovery, circular economy, and the climate mitigation nexus. But let's go straight into it because we have a packed agenda full of really inspiring speakers. And I would like to start by giving the floor to Ambassador Olaf Skog, head of the EU delegation to the UN for his opening remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Jocelyn, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good to see you, very pleased with the uh, participation uh, today. Um, and um, of course, a special uh, uh, expression of gratitude to the missions of Singapore, Kenya, Finland, and the Netherlands for co-hosting this with us today. We are really delighted that so many could join us to learn more about the importance of transitioning to a circular economy for climate, for building back better and stronger <clears throat> and for our joint efforts to reach the sustainable development goals. Circular economy means an economy with the objective to keep products and materials in the economy for as long as possible and to create incentives to preserve value. We will hear about the science behind this today and how to make it a part of enhanced NDCs, making also the econo economic case and how the transition to a circular economy helps create jobs and uh, so many other benefits. The European Union adopted its first circular economy action plan in 2015, and we stepped it up further in our Green Deal. By 2021, this has become a bandwagon, I would say, of a global agenda. Last Monday, during the UN Environment Assembly, the EU, UNEP and UNIDO, launched the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency. Canada, Chile, Colombia, Japan, Kenya, New Zealand, Nigeria, Norway, Peru, Rwanda, and South Africa have joined the alliance, and more countries, I'm sure, are expected to join very soon. Hopefully, colleagues, the discussions today will inspire more governments to follow suit and the UN to make the circular economy a pillar of its climate strategies. 2021 is a pivotal year for recovering better and greener and to address the triple related crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. We need to look at opportunities. Transitioning to a circular economy must be a key pillar of our decisions. We have reached a fork in the road. We can either continue straight ahead into and follow back into our bad habits, or we can choose the other road, use the chance now to build back better and find a way where we work with nature and not against it. Thank you very much, colleagues, for joining us. And I'm happy to listen to, uh, to my colleagues now. Thanks. Over to you, Justine. Thank you very much, Ambassador Skogan, for mentioning the, uh, the joint effort between the UN and the uh, European Commission on the uh, Global Alliance, which is a very important development. Uh, I would now like to turn to our co-host, uh, Singapore, and we'll hand over the microphone to Ambassador Buran Gafour. Um, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Singapore is delighted to co-host uh, this event with the European Union and Kenya and other friends. Um, I wanted to make three points very quickly. Uh, the first point is that in order to make the transition to a circular economy, the government can and must play a leadership role. And we think in Singapore that an integrated and interconnected approach to policy making and policy implementation is key because ultimately to make the transition to the circular economy, one must take a holistic perspective across the value chain from sustainable production, sustainable consumption, sustainable waste and resource management. That's the first point that I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make is that in Singapore, we had to do this out of necessity because uh, land is scarce and so are uh, every resource which is important. We began with our big experiment with water 
in Singapore, the water loop is closed, which means that every drop of water that falls on Singapore is captured, recycled, reused, and it continues in a circular way. Likewise, in 2019, we started an ambitious plan called the Zero Waste Master Plan to enable a nationwide integrated approach to reusing and recycling by focusing on the waste stream, food waste, electrical and electronic waste, and packaging waste. And by integrating it, we are actually telling people, producers, manufacturers, to reduce right at the outset, at the point of production, packaging, so that there is no packaging waste or minimal packaging waste. And the same applies to food, um, whether it's growing urban agriculture or producing uh, restaurant quality food, the idea is to avoid waste and recycle them so that either it's used for energy or it is uh, given away to those who might need it. Uh, the last point that I wanted to make is that there is a very, very strong case for uh, the circular economy, making the transition to the circular economy. We have realized from our experience that it creates a whole ecosystem of industry and innovation. People who are interested and able to recycle, create value and find innovative solutions for manufacturing and production so as to reduce waste. And this too, I think brings a lot of benefit. So to put it simply, this transition to the circular economy is not only critical uh, in order to help and save the planet, uh, but it also has many dividends uh, for the economy and society as a whole. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Thank you, Ambassador Gafour. And uh, thank you for mentioning the importance of sustainable consumption and production which is of course the, at the heart of the circular economy. Let us now go to Kenya, where in reality, we all should be attending UNEA 5 at the moment. And I would like to hand over the floor to Ambassador Jambi Kinyungu. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, and yes, indeed, it would have been wonderful to be in Nairobi. Uh, and uh, we hope it will be different next year. Um, Mine is to actually just take the opportunity to thank you all for coming for this important event. Uh, and we are all looking forward to a very good uh, discussion. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us of the urgent need to protect human environment, uh, human health and environment, particularly in our growing towns and cities. Uh, I would just speak to the urban population in Africa and other developing countries, which is rising and accelerating at a very fast rate, indeed calls for us to pay a lot more attention to the, um, to the, uh, to the topic of today. I, as you all know, due to poor disposal of uh, plastic waste in 2017, Kenya enacted a law that imposed a plus as strict ban on the use, manufacturing, and import of single-use plastic bags. Indeed, we have seen a response to this. We have seen innovations emanating from this, this act of uh, parliament. Uh, and we have seen our rural and peri-urban and towns also becoming visibly cleaner. We've also seen that uh, the producers have now taken a responsibility to ensure that the bags they use are well disposed of. And also Kenya has also now enacted e-waste guidelines that are providing a framework uh, for identification, collection, sorting, recycling, and disposing of electrical and electronic waste, something that uh, His Excellency of Singapore referred to. I would just like to highlight two important factors. One is on the issue of data and information, science and research, which continue to play an instrumental role in providing the necessary knowledge for policy formulation, innovations, technological advancement and behavioral changes for effective mitigation against climate change. There is a need to actually address and ensure that we are able to share this data and information and also transfer of science and technology. We have also seen, uh, we would also call for partnerships between the, the, those countries that are very strong in science and technology and with regard to research as far as the economy, the circular economy is concerned. And finally, uh, the issue of financing is a key factor on this circular economy. And we believe that it is going to be one of the issues that will be addressed, including through the Global Alliance of the Circular Economy. I thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kenyungu. It's uh, indeed very important to have this global dimension and to be uh, able to include countries that have been forerunning, such as Kenya, in the discussion. We are going to now conclude this first round of opening remarks by coming back to Europe and actually <laughs> going to the, uh, one of the pioneers in circular economy in Europe, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and I'm happy to hand it over to Ambassador Joke Brandt. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jocelyn, and good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. We are happy to host uh, this important uh, event together with the EU, Singapore and Kenya. And it's uh, really great to see that so many of you have been able to join. As you just said, the Netherlands has been a big proponent of the circular economy and is one of the first countries with a government-wide commitment to become fully circular by 2050. And I would like to make uh, three brief points. First, on the um, urgency, because as Olaf just said, we are at the fork in the road. So we believe that moving uh, from a linear to a circular economy is the bold transformation that we need to attain the sustainable development goals and deliver on the commitments of the Paris Agreement. It is basically the only way to ensure that humanity can move from depleting the planet towards a fully sustainable use of the planet's resources for future generations. It's indeed about our own survival in the Anthropocene, as UNDP stated in its latest, in its latest human development report. Secondly, is um, that this is about um, uh, as much about the environment and the economy as it is about setting social norms. So we believe that it is important that the discussion doesn't only take place in Nairobi, where we obviously all would like to be, but also in many other fora, including here in uh, New York, because we need to broaden the discussion from the environmental realm to the broader social economic space. And of course, as um, uh, the ambassador of Singapore just said, the member states have a big part to play here, but we also believe the UN can and should take a robust convener role in line with the lead that it has taken in providing a sustainable transformative vision of where the world should head. And we look forward to hearing from UNDP and from others about their ideas for an integrated approach towards a circular global economy. Third and final point, as you said, on the 15th and 16th of April, the Netherlands will, together with the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA, host the World Circular, circular Economy Forum Plus on Climate. Uh, this will be a high level a forum that focuses on demonstrating the contribution the circular economy can make in realizing our climate ambitions and achieving the sustainable development goals. The partic participation of the Deputy Secretary General, the UNDP Administrator, the UNIDO Executive Director, and a wide range of participants from the public and the private sector shows again how this topic is rapidly taking shape and picking up pace. The forum will deliver an action statement, a series of concrete commitments from stakeholders from the public and private sector to accelerate circular economy as a crucial element of our climate action. On that note, I look forward to representatives of Chile, the Gambia and Vanuatu today sharing their valuable experiences on the link between NDCs and the transition to a circular economy. I hope we will all leave this event uh, inspired to take action and work together for the transition to a circular economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Brand. And, and as you said, the uh, World Circular Economy Forum has played an instrumental role in really making the conversation international, global, and opening it up beyond the, uh, the realm of the early adopters, which of course the Netherlands and, and Finland are the most uh, important uh, examples. Now, of course, something struck me in, in what you said. You said moving from depletion as a way of creating value, which is quite a, a big, uh, important systemic shift because the circular economy is about creating value through building social, economic and natural capital. And that's, that's the massive systemic shift, which means deep uh, structural reforms needed as well. So it's, it's very much a private innovation stroke uh, public sector uh, enabling conditions discussion that needs to be had because it is a space of opportunity. And the discussion really has moved on 
geographically but because it concerns a global landscape, but it also has moved on in terms of mindset. We're now far away, it seems, from talking uh, about circular economy as a mere technicality, as a waste management issue. It really is a holistic system perspective. And on that note, I'm really delighted to now hand over to Janusz Toshnik, who really is one of the key pioneers of development of circular economy with the European Resource Efficiency Platform starting in 2012 and that multi-stakeholder approach. And Yanis, you're going to talk to us about the importance of circular economy as a strategy to achieve the climate ambitions as well. So please, in your role as the co-chair of the International Resource Panel, enlighten us. Thank you, Jos. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, to the co-hosts of the meeting for inviting me to this important preparatory event on circular economy and climate. I'm happy to introduce the International Resource Panel perspective on the topic, as well as to learn about the approach of the other speakers. Let me frame my perspective in three main points. First, why resource management or circular economy is indispensable for effective climate action. Second, why a resource management approach is crucial to effective modern global governance. And third, what governance change leaders like those around the table today can promote at the World Circular Economy Forum in April and in Glasgow at the COP26. First, why are resources and their management in circular economy essential to mitigating the climate change? The concept note you received uh, with the invitation for this meeting already uh, explained this aspect quite well, and I'm happy to see that you read our reports. The IRP Global Resource Outlook 2019 showed clearly that over 50% of global GHG emissions are caused by natural resource extraction and processing. So only the extraction and first refinement of raw materials already cause over 20 gigatons of CO2 per year. These materials include metals, non-metallic minerals, biomass, and the extraction and refinery of fossil fuels. If you look at what is more commonly referred as materials, namely metals, minerals, construction wood and plastics, this alone amount to 23% of global emissions. These emissions are often referred to as heavy industry emissions. And in traditional charts, you would not find these emissions labeled as material emissions. This is because most of these material related emissions are caused by the steel and cement, cement industry in very energy intensive refinery process. A more traditional climate approach would ask, how can we reduce the emissions of these industrial processes by making them more energy efficient or using renewable energy. This is certainly important and it is good that more and more parties are working on the necessary technological innovations to making material production cleaner. And this is also high on the agenda of the COP26 presidency. What is often overlooked though, or at least not put at the forefront of these conversations is that the approach of cleaning up production alone is missing an important part of potential policy potential and will likely never reach net zero emissions by 2050. This is mainly because first, some technologies are still in development and won't be deployable fast and wide enough. Second, some of the emissions do not come from energy but inherent chemical reactions. And third, such an increase in the renewable energy production will in itself require large amount of materials, also rare materials. One could say in an absurd way, we produce even more materials to decarbonize the production of other materials. Global material demand in GROW 2019 business as usual scenario is projected to double by 2060. So there is no way to decarbonize all that production in time and without massive trade-offs. Therefore, the only chance for reaching our 2030 and 2050 climate goals is to deploy all measures possible to defy that business as usual scenario. This means reducing the need for new materials as much as we can, while of course taking into account 
that those countries in need of developing their basic infrastructure will still need to increase their use. How could we reduce these impacts in an integrated manner? The most effective way is to start at the end where the product systems meet the societal need with a question. Let's take an example of houses and vehicles. How many of them are actually needed and used? And could we redesign this system in a far more efficient way? And here is where natural resource management and circular economy is an important instrument comes into the play. There are great opportunities across sectors to design and create better and smarter. Cities can become more compact and buildings more space and material efficient at high living quality. Transport can become shared, connected and more integrated to avoid cars standing around empty or clogging traffic and to save massive amounts of materials. This would also free up a lot of space for nature. Of course, also the production of the system elements like houses and vehicles must be cleaner using renewable energy and alternative materials. But once we have designed the systems better to service societal needs at minimal resource input, there is much less production to be cleaned up. And it's of course not only about houses and vehicles, heavy machinery can be shared through smart platforms and they're manufactured given the right design. On the biomaterial front or biomass, we can create healthy meals with more plant-based proteins, reduce food waste, enable nutrient cycling and design agricultural practices in regenerative ways. And there are many more examples of how to reduce material use in industry and of course, everyday lives. Interestingly, current climate policies mostly start from the other side of the picture. They first ask how to clean up energy production and how to use cleaner energy in industrial production, not asking how much of that production is actually useful for society in the first place. More and more, they do indeed start looking also to energy efficiency, but they barely look at how do systems such as housing or mobility be more resource efficient as a whole, avoiding energy intense production in the first place. There is a double benefit to such circular measures. And these are rarely talked about, not even inside, let's call it our circular community. What I mean is the inherent synergy between system dematerialization measures and operational energy use. What does this mean? If you design a city for a systemic material efficiency, you will have more compact neighborhood designs space efficient buildings, shorter commutes and fewer cars. All of this reduce material consumption, but it also reduces the need for heating and for fuel use. A double win for climate and a double chance for humanity to actually win the climate change battle. So to my second point, and the last two points will be of course shorter, how can circular economy on the resources management approach and we call it in the, as we call it in the IRP, inspire better governance. When we come to the how, the lens of natural resource management is helpful to create integrated tools. Why? Too many times our policy focus is on the impacts and consequences rather than on drivers and pressures causing them. When it comes to impacts, the awareness that climate and biodiversity consequences are correlated is finally emerging. Finally, because it's not so difficult to understand that both are caused by the same logic of drivers and pressures. Both are connected to the human activity, to the unsustainable economy we have created. Only in the case of climate, they are more directly linked to certain economic sectors, like for example, energy, and in the case of biodiversity loss to other sectors, like food systems and forestry. The climate biodiversity nexus and approach could be easily extended also to the pollution and health implications, which are based on the same drivers and pressures but our political understanding is not yet there if we are frank. So at the very heart of the resource management approach is the idea of understanding drivers and of impacts. Through analysis of material flows, we can trace wanted or unwanted impacts back through their casual chains to their drivers in economic and human behavior. In governance, the logic should actually be the same. I know from my own experiences 
that the difficult reality for policymakers responsible for the protection of environment is that they are responsible for solving the problems while majority of the tools, instruments for effective solutions are in the hands of other colleagues in the government or in the commission. The success of environment policy does to a large extent depends on the understanding and willingness of those colleagues to listen and to associate their voices with environmental policy, in particular on the understanding and willingness of those colleagues that are responsible for the areas with the highest environmental impacts, impacts on climate change, biodiversity loss, health and pollution. Only by bringing those in charge of the impacts together with those in charge of resource use can we develop really effective joint vision, joint targets and joint policy pathways. Even in climate, where energy and climate voices were more than a decade ago brought at the same table, this is not so obvious. And we, for example, still need climate champions at COP to mobilize industry. And on the political level, it would certainly help if environmental policymakers would join the forces with those in charge for the economic and social incentives that shape the production and consumption to better share the responsibility in finding and developing solutions and creating a joint ownership for SDGs related transition. So we need something like a circular update also to the governance. Which brings me to my final point, what to call for at the World Circular Economy Forum in April and all the way to Glasgow to make a real difference. The UNFCC conferences, as well as the CBD and other global environmental processes, do not convene those in charge of resource use drivers, and maybe they cannot. These forums are already complex and big, and their task to specify impact targets, reporting frameworks, and so on, it's already huge. But we need a global forum where those with direct policy influence on the resource drivers are obliged to become part of the search for solution efforts. Global Alliance recently established could be an excellent base and a real drive in this direction. We need a formal intergovernmental discussion where environmental, economic, and social decision makers would discuss the fundamental transitions necessary towards a global economic model that keeps resource use within planetary boundaries while improving, of course, global social equity. I cannot say which exact format this could have if we need a new UN convention, for example, but I'm confident that voluntary alliances and, comp and compacts will not be sufficient. The debate needs to be on the multilateral level so that the top economic decision makers feel the pressure and motivation to really engage in solution finding. Of course, I know that coming to a global agreement of any sort might take years, if not decades. However, this is not only about the signed agreement in the end, it's about the formal and the public process, which will make sustainable resources management the responsibilities of all ministries, international institutions, and state stakeholders. To finalize, ladies and gentlemen, just yesterday, I have had an interview organized to discuss the future potential developments of VCF. And one of the main messages was, it is important to continue with the initiative, to strengthen its international role, and to build bridges, which would help creating ownership and responsibility across countries and policies. This is needed and this is lacking. So let's use the World Circular Economy Forum, as well as Glasgow, to kick off the discussion, how to create a global governance forum, not only when it comes to plastics, where, for example, the appetite is already high and emerging, but more generally, to ensure coherent approach to sustainable resource use, and the global economic mobile model that functions inherently within the planetary boundaries. I know it would not be easy, and I know that the initial reaction of many would be that we do not need another heavy international instrument. But before making any final conclusion, please do ask yourselves a very simple question. Would it be useful? And would it be actually necessary if we want to move the sustainability transition to another gear and stop pointing to each other and waiting on each other. In politics, finding good excuses sounds always attractive, but the real judgment is always subsequent to time. 
and it is always a good feeling, learning in due time that one was on the right side of the history. We have that chance. Dear friends, we have a unique chance and an enormous responsibility to recover better. And circular economy, it's an essential ingredient if we want to succeed. Thank you for your attention and back to you, Jos. Thanks a lot, Janusz. That was really enlightening, uh, as expected. And actually, the chat function is on fire with the people requesting to have your notes and your speech, because as Mr. Harris puts it, he's seldom heard such a lucid take on such a complex issue. And you did mention the uh, UN dimension side of this, uh, this story. And I'd like to get the circular economy and climate perspective in the UN system. And for that, I would like Mr. Selwyn Hart, Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Climate Action and ASG for the Climate Action Team to uh, give us his perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and first, let me thank you and, um, and the co-hosts for and co-conveners for, um, for inviting me to participate. And um, I too would like a copy of that um, intervention. Um, th this conversation um, takes place at an extremely um, opportune time when, when the world, quite frankly, is looking for options to address the, the crisis related to climate disruption, biodiversity loss, pollution, and of course, recover from the COVID-19 crisis. And just, just last week, this Secretary General said at the launch of the UNEP's Making Peace with Nature report that for too long, we have been waging a senseless and suicidal war on nature. And, and the scope and complexity and the severity of this war and challenge um, is, is a part. We are headed for a uh, greater than three degree increase in average temperature. Um, the burden has fallen and will fall disproportionately to the most vulnerable, um, those on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, women uh, uh, represent 80%, for example, of those displaced by climate disruption. Um, more than 1 million of the planet's estimated 8 million plants and animal species are at risk of extinction. Air pollution causes 6.5 million premature deaths on an annual basis. Polluted water um, uh, um, kills a further 1.8 million, predominantly children and other vulnerable um, and marginalized groups of society. And meanwhile, 1.3 billion people remain poor and over 700 million are, are hungry. So we know the, the scope of the challenge related to um, not only poverty, but unsustainable production and consumption patterns. But we also know the opportunities of circular economy approaches. What are some of the opportunities that can be gained if we were to adopt these approaches? It will definitely help, as many speakers have said this morning, in in implementing and achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the goals of the Paris Agreement, and it will contribute to job creation and economic growth. It is estimated that shifting towards a circular economy could add um, about one trillion to the global economy by 2025, prevent um, 100 million tons of waste and generate 100,000 jobs within five years. Um, and there are various estimates, for example, um, there are the estimates that um, a circular economy approach could create um, or have a net increase of jobs um, of 6 million by 2030. So 
um, what is being done in the context of the um, UN system, um, the chief executive's board recently approved um, a strategy for sustainable management in the UN 2020 to 2030, which commits the UN system to reinforce the circular economy through its procurement system and the detailed guidelines are to be developed um, sometime in, in 2021. Um, since 2017, the UN has also been implementing an environmental strategy for our peacekeeping operations, which seeks to reduce our waste and environmental degradation footprint, as well as um, address um, greenhouse gas emissions. So th th there is some activity within the UN system, but obviously we need to go much further and much faster. So on the way forward in general, I, I, I um, share the perspectives of my friend, distinguished ambassador of Singapore and others on the need for strong leadership by governments. So my first point on the way forward is that governments, it's absolutely essential that governments create the enabling and policy environment needed to incentivize circular economy systems across their respective economies. But for this to take root in any economy, and this is my second point, and to unlock the value of the circular economy requires strong collaboration across the many diverse actors along um, national, regional, and international value chains. It's absolutely indispensable that the private sector, consumers, households, and others are fully involved in, um, in operationalizing um, any policy guidance related to the circular economy. Third and finally, both public and private finance will need to be aligned with um, circular economy approaches. And in particular, I see a role for the multilateral development banks. The MDB must play a crucial role in channeling capital to transform business models and, and accelerate the, the, the domestic transformation and transition to circular systems. So, I see these three points, uh, role of government, um, ensuring strong collaboration, and the alignment of public and private finance as absolute, absolute um, necessities for us to undertake the type of acceleration and action that many of the colleagues have suggested. So we look forward to continuing to have this dialogue um, with you as we head towards Glasgow, um, but it's a conversation that will not end at Glasgow. And um, we, and as we look to advance implementation of the decade of action, certainly hope that this will be an issue that rises to the top of our agenda. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hart, uh, and thanks for highlighting the uh, the role of uh, national government in uh, advancing that circular economy uh, climate policy nexus. So we're now going to move into the panel discussion uh, side of the event where we focus on country experiences. And in order to get us started, I would like to ask Cassie Flynn, head of the Climate Promise at UNDP, to talk to us a bit about circular economy in the NDC enhancement process. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you to, to everyone at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and our co-hosts today from the EU, Netherlands, Singapore, Kenya, and Finland. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to, to be here today, and, and it's such a treat to, to listen to all of the speakers that have uh, so well framed, framed this issue. Um, from my vantage point, um, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm the head of something called UNDP's Climate Promise, and this is our offer to support countries to enhance their pledges underneath the Paris Agreement. And we're currently in eight, 118 countries doing this work, and 
it's sort of helped us to be able to uh, to to do everything that we can to help countries to be as ambitious as possible. And something you know that we hear so much is is this is this word ambition, uh, ambition on mitigation, ambition on adaptation, ambition on finance, and. Something now that I think is important in the context of this conversation is, is thinking about what it looks like to be ambitious as we are implementing this work on the ground. And circular economy is critical to this. We cannot achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. We cannot achieve a 1.5 degree world without thinking about how circular economy really looks on the ground at a speed and scale uh, that is unlike anything that that we have we have seen before, and certainly you know within uh, within the context of NDCs, I think that there's a particular opportunity here to to really harness these NDCs, uh, to really think about how we can transition from this linear to circular model using the sectors that are within NDCs. And within the climate promise, we see that there is a real appetite for this. We, we are seeing countries really start to lead the way on how they can reduce emissions from a sector, but then also start to think about what this means on, uh, on a scale that not only, uh, as, as I think Yanez was, was saying, that you know, having this double, this double benefit and this benefit that not only reduces emissions, but also feeds into the broader interconnectivity of, of society. And I really just want to mention a couple of a couple of points um, on this. Um, one is I, I think that this is such a such a moment of, of opportunity that it isn't just about the, the waste sector, it isn't just about a, a single sector, that really helping circular economy to be the thread that binds the entire way that our operating system works. And certainly, you know, in, in the example that, and I so appreciate, Yana, as you, you know, what you were talking about with sort of being as, as efficient as possible and, and thinking about, you know, something like the design of, of, of green buildings that, of course, that has a profound impact on reducing emissions. But we also know that green buildings help people to be more productive. We know that people who are, uh, are ill are, heal faster in green buildings. And that there is a, a, a way that circular economy can also help to contribute to the way that we are, are living our lives in a, in a, in a much more um, sort of healthy and productive way. And I think that this is particularly important as we're thinking about how we are moving in the world when it comes to, when it comes to COVID-19. And then the other point that, that I want to make sort of building on, on the speakers before is is connecting circular economy to this global governance conversation. You know, within the UNFCCC process, we have all of these tools that have been talked about for, for years and years. And I think these are such profound entry points for circular economy and for holding governments accountable for these circular economy uh, plans and, and strategies that may come out of things like, like NDCs and long-term strategies and, and net zero strategies toward, toward 2050. I also think there's a moment to use these, and this is where I think the, uh, uh, the World Circular Economy Forum can be so helpful, is to enable learning. Um, and I know we're going to hear uh, some fantastic stories from Vanuatu and Gambia and, and, and others today. And I think that this is, is important for all of us to be learning from each other about how we can be as ambitious as possible when it comes to uh, implementing our targets. And that means having a circular economy approach, not just a linear one. So looking forward to, uh, to hearing from, from colleagues today and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Cassie. And indeed, let's go straight into uh, concrete examples. And I'm delighted to hand it over to Gonzalo Munoz, the high level champion UNFCCC for Chile. And the foundation has been working closely with Chile uh, on their national roadmap. Indeed, this is a country that was pioneer in the American continent, especially when it comes to integrating circular economy in the NDC. Gonzalo, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Jos. And then, of course, thanks to the leadership of the European Union and, and Singapore, Kenya, Finland, and the Netherlands for uh, giving us this opportunity. Um, well, I, I was invited to, to 
give you the, the, the story of how the circular economy started framing in Chile and at the, at the end is also established uh, not only in the natural determinant contribution, but also in some other aspects around the politics uh, that are moving the world, the, the, the country towards a circular economy uh, developing system. Uh, I, I would like to, to start referring to something that might sound uh, not as important, but it's always really, really relevant. And it's th it, that you should start by declaring the importance, right? And in the case of Chile, I would, I would say that most of the uh, acceleration of the trajectory that was, of course, based on years and years of people working in different sectors that are not properly aggregated around circular economy, we had a change when uh, in the last um, political program for the presidency, uh, almost five years ago, there was a declaration on the importance of the circular economy. So th th that was really, really relevant because at the end, the government, when it started settling, they had to, to do some changes. And one of the really important changes was to, to change the name of the area internally in the Ministry of Environment that was taking, that was um, managing all the waste system around the country. It was changed toward the circular economy department. So, and, and that also, it's something that is absolutely mental, is, 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 is a narrative but that starts mobilizing a lot of things and putting together a lot of efforts. I would say that probably this, the, the following action uh, was around structuring much more initiatives and opportunities for putting together the different actors from the academy, uh, civil society, business associations. We have in Chile quite a strong entrepreneurial uh, um, community, mostly related to innovation and social impact. So putting all of them together as well, and then starting doing quite a lot of events, academic programs, a lot of media publication. Yourself, Josh, you were one of the people invited to one of those initial events that started setting right uh, part of those really important conversations would you, you immediately starting to position the concept and change the whole narrative around what is not only about solving a waste problem, but it's taking a look about the whole value change and of course, putting a lot of focus and effort upstream on changing the design of the waste that we do. Uh, we have also a reality that is common to some, uh, a lot of other countries in relation to the waste, the waste pickers. And, and, and that is, has been really, really important, not only in Chile, but in Brazil, Colombia, and many other countries in Latin America, putting together the, 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 this group of uh, social entrepreneurs that are looking many times and uh, working in the invisibility uh, in order for them to also be aligned towards creating a, 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 an economy that is circular as a whole. Then I would say plastics is always a really important entry point. So banning the plastic bags or doing some type of uh, uh, regulation around single use plastics have been very important because that sends a really important signal to all of the community, whether it's users and citizens or to the producers and the importers of different types of products. Uh, at the end, that sends the right signal saying, people, we know what took us here. We have to change certain things that might have been good in the past are not good enough uh, for the future. Of course, one of the things that started uh, taking form in, in, the, in the last three years is the development of a roadmap. And that roadmap has been working uh, until now. We have now uh, this roadmap being shared by, by, by the Chilean government to the whole community in order for everyone to be able to uh, give some opinions about how the roadmap was designed. It was designed through work on about 80 people all of us coming from different sectors of society and giving their own perceptions and approach to the different difficulties. We, of course, have never been in trying to invent the wheel. We have been using the best examples and references, starting by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and Joss and Andrew and Antonia and many other people have been working with us, but also the World Economic Forum, CITRA, McDonald Innovation Center, countries, uh, country examples like France have been very important. You need to, of course, and PACE, Minister Schmidt is now sitting at the board of PACE, the platform for accelerated circular economy. And, and she's also a big global supporting on creating those connections between countries. She, 
one of their last phrases was to live in a world where nothing goes to waste. Uh, we need to reinforce the notion of triple win by implementing circular economy in order to speed up a sustainable recovery from COVID, advance decent work and mitigate the climate crisis. And when it comes to climate crisis, it's all about circular economy. We have to reduce waste, but we also have to start regenerating nature. And that connects very properly to the NDCs, where we are talking about the reduction of waste and the increase of climate actions. We still know that we have relevant challenges. Trade, Chile is a country that is buying stuff from many regions of the world. We need to improve what comes to our country and start saying we don't want to buy more waste. We have a big, a big challenge around mining, agribusiness, fashion, medicine, right? A really important one more, more than ever now due to the pandemic. And finally, connecting to what Janice told, right? Uh, and I'm going to refer to what we're doing with uh, my dear friend and, and high level climate champion, uh, uh, fellow Nigel Topping from the UK. We understand ourselves as those kind of bridges that you refer to between countries, the parties and the business sectors in uh, cities investors. And we have been developing some mechanisms to bring circular economy into the work of the high level climate action champions. Josh, you were as well part of what we did uh, in, in 2019 towards COP25. We have an instance putting together the circular economy into uh, the, the, the program on, on climate action, but also the 1.5 pathways with, where Josh's team has been working on positioning and kind of filtering that the proposal coming from the climate action agenda is also being checked around its circularity as well as its inclusivity. So uh, we need to scale up the efforts and I believe that Chile's experience uh, helps in terms of understanding that the circular economy can be absolutely critical in order to achieve climate goals. And I wish that this will be a great preparation for a really successful meeting in Holland in April this year. Thank you very much. Gracias, Gonzalo. It's great to hear such uh, passion and all-encompassing action. Uh, Mr. Jalo, Bubakar Jalo, Principal Climate Change Officer for the Gambia, I'd like to get your reaction and also your country experience, of course, on, on what's just been said. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. First of all, I'd like to thank the EU and also recognize the presence of the uh, ambassadors from the various countries um, present. And basically, it's been a very informative meeting for me. I've learned a lot listening to, to Yanis and as well as um, the previous speaker. And I think the circular economy is far from a new, uh, something new or novel to the African context. Arguably, you could say that it's even part of our cultural heritage and the indigenous knowledge of the Gambia, which we've outlined. Um, looks to step away from just focusing on a single sector industry and looking across even national borders. Uh, um, as such, we're looking to um, define collaborative strategies to deliver a circular economy in line with our national objectives. Mr. Um, Jarrett, the line has is led us to think of new uh, avenues for the Gambia to act on like, with regards to helping us. Hello, can you hear me? The, the line is a bit challenging, so I suggest that if you try to turn off your video, you have. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Sir? Yes, much better. Carry yes, um, as I was saying, um, the circular economy is not new to Af is, yeah, it's not new to the African context and is can be taken to be part of our cultural heritage and also the indigenous knowledge of uh, my country, the Gambia. Um, with regards to the development of our NDC, from which we are um, getting support from the UNDP climate promise, as which uh, steps away from just looking at a single sector industry and looks across national borders, we're also looking to define collaborative strategies to develop a circular economy in line with our national objective um, to safeguard natural resources, avoid waste, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this would, we think, would open up new avenues for the Gambia to act on implementing and achieving its climate ambitions, as well as the Paris Agri Agreement commitments. I think it's also an opportunity to refine our development pathway, as well as growth, uh, looking at it through the lens of uh, more of a metabolic efficiency, where bioflows and stocks of materials are considered as a um, looking at the resource flows in the Gambia, I think will really help us to identify opportunities for resource and energy efficiency measures. 
through the application of circular economy strategies. The objective here would be to find mitigation opportunities that would go beyond the climate mitigation commitments which the Gambia has already expressed in its first national determined contribution. Um, just to give an example of current um, circular economy opportunities that exist within the primary sectors being um, agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. We already have initiatives of growing seedlings from fish waste and groundnut shells, um, which is generated from the fisheries sector as well as the agriculture sector. Also looking at how to um, enhance training of farmers on regenerative agriculture and reducing food loss. Because as we know, for most developing countries, uh, the harvest might be good, but post harvest loss is always a challenge. We're also working um, very seriously with reforestation as well as cook stove efficiency, because one of the major problems with regards to deforestation is charcoal burning, etc. So we're trying to move people away from that mindset. Um, community managed agroforestry is also currently being uh, implemented, as well as looking at ways to improve the livestock um, productivity. Um, also, in the construction sector, we have initiatives such as compressed stabilized ad bricks, which are being used as construction material. We're also looking um, very, we are looking um, at tourism as well and eco villages. Uh, building with compressed ad blocks and raising environmental awareness. And in the industry sector, um, we have some initiatives such as deposit, deposition schemes on glass bottles, also a business indicator, incubator for agro processing, turning waste plastics into uh, paving tiles, um, etc. So this is just to give an, an idea that, I mean, as Janice said, um, we need to look at everything that would work and not just looking at one sector or one area or one country. And I think um, this is some, uh, somehow not new for the Gambia, but also new with regards to, re, uh, to reporting this on the NDC, because in the previous NDC, no circular economy uh, measures were, were, were taken on board. But looking at what is happening in the country, and we're making a lot of progress with regards to the development of our NDC, uh, we strongly believe that a lot of our mitigation measures will be uh, taking the circular uh, economy approach. Thank you very much, Mr. Jalu, and thanks for uh, bringing such a focus on the uh, on the biosphere as well, on the importance of land use, regenerative agriculture, which of course is is a massive part of the equation, and that brings us also to uh, COP15 biodiversity later in the year. Uh, Mr. Anthony Garay, Director, Department of Energy for the Ministry of Climate Change of Vanuatu, I would really love to have your perspective now on these questions and on the integration of circular economy and climate change policies. Economic growth is too often accompanied by a gradual decrease in the quality of ecosystems and a gradual deterioration of natural assets such as soils, marine, environments, fish, forestries. Uh, by redefining development from a systems perspective, um, we can grow our infrastructure and building stock to meet society needs while moving away from the linear economy model that places long-term development ambitions at risk. As part of a project supported by um, UNDP, uh, Fonatu has mapped out national resources uh, use. This system approach applied in Vanuatu uh, departs from a focus on single sector or industry. Um, it even departs from defining the country's ability to influence emission only uh, within its uh, national borders. Uh, rather, uh, it defines collaborative strategies to develop a secular economy along domestic and international value chains and across sectors. Um, the strategies <coughs> aim to support our country with achieving national objectives to safeguard natural assets, avoid waste and reduce greenhouse gas um, emissions or GHG emissions. Um, well, this way of thinking opens uh, new avenues for Vanuatu to act on uh, its climate ambitions and commitments under Paris Agreement and align this with its effort to achieve the National Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, which relates to primary resource extraction and waste. This approach um, uh, redefines development and growth, viewing them from uh, the lens of metabolic efficiency and inspired by nature, where waste <laughs> Um, does not exist. Identifying complementary GHG mitigation opportunities through the circular economy was part of an effort to further enhance 
Tomatoes are a national uh, data mining contribution or its mitigation pledge under the Paris Agreement. Um, the revised NDC will submit to the UNFCCC soon. Wonderful. And of course, uh, this was a pre record and I should have stated that up front. Uh, the, the full comments will be uh, made live, made available on the uh, delegation's Facebook page. And uh, you can then appreciate the whole breadth of what Van Watu is doing in that field. Looking at time, I think it's good now if we move to the uh, Q&A part of the discussion and take uh, questions from the floor, statements from other countries. And of course, as usual, the ask will be here to try to be as concise and precise as possible so we can invite as many participants as we can within the allocated time frame. So the questions can be put in the chat. And I see that Sweden would like the floor. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizer for organizers for this very excellent and timely event. Uh, circular economy is essential in contributing to uh, the environmental and climate goals as well as several of the goals within the 2030 agenda. And so the connection between circular economy and climate is a highly relevant issue. Transitioning to a circular economy, as has been highlighted today, will require deep structural transformation and fundamental change in our social systems. Um, innovative technology, innovative finance and coordinated policy. Last year, the Swedish government adopted a national strategy on circular economy, and this will guide us in our work towards the circular economy while also creating opportunities for new jobs and sustainable business. The uh, proposed uh, Stockholm Plus 50 conference in June 2022 uh, presents uh, another great opportunity to build back better and set us on a clear path towards working with nature, not against it. Circular economy is an essential ingredient for success, for advancing green, just, and inclusive recovery by accelerating the shift towards sustainable consumption and production, leaving no one behind. So we very much welcome the World Circular Economy Forum plus climate uh, in April, uh, highlighting how circular economy can contribute to and generate action towards climate neutrality. If appropriate, uh, Stockholm Plus 50 could provide an opportunity to take forward relevant outcomes. And so we are very interested in learning more about the possible outcomes and possible commitments uh, that Netherlands foresee from this conference. But again, I'd like to thank um, everyone for uh, this uh, very timely and, uh, and most relevant uh, initiative today. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Mr. Lennartson, for this. Uh, I would uh, now maybe like to ask uh, Kerry Mack from Global Affairs Canada if he can uh, summarize his question on the role of circular economy in the, in the just transition, and maybe if that question was asked to somebody specifically. Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, no, I, I was trying to throw something on the margin of this discussion, uh, recognizing the importance of circular economy and the contribution it can make, just to suggest that um, one of the biggest challenges we are all going to have as we implement these changes is finding solutions for what is termed a just transition finding solutions for those that are most heavily affected by the changes that have to happen in all of our economies. And I'm wondering if any of uh, the panelists have thought about linking the economic opportunities and the rationale for circular economy also to that just transition and seeing to what extent that might shore up the argument for circular economy from a different perspective. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh... Anybody from the previous panel who would like to address this question? If they're still uh, able to open their microphones. Oh, I, 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 can, I can just mention that, that, that for us is a condition, right? Uh, we, we understand that as a, uh, 
as an element that is indeed is embedded now in the NDCs, uh, just transition uh, and, and incorporating circular economy, both at the same text, we're referring to the importance of moving uh, both at the same time. I, I can imagine that that differs from country to country and type of economy, but in our case, as I said, incorporating on one side, the most vulnerable uh, in this, in, in many cases being uh, the, the group of the way speaker, but at the same time, mobilizing our, our the, the decarbonization of our economy in a way that uh, everyone, like no one is left behind and we have the possibility of uh, developing even better jobs for all of those that are, might be losing their jobs with, with the decarbonization or the close of the, for example, the coal power plants. So that, that's absolutely integrated and we consider that as a must. Thanks very much, Gonzalo. And of course, there's a, a transition at uh, citizen workers level. Uh, there's also one at, at country level when countries who are dependent on extraction and, and the sales of uh, raw materials are going to be also affected by the transition and it needs to be thought of very early on in the process. I'd like to now give the floor to Austria and then after that we will go to Chad. Uh, thank you very much, um, Excellencies, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation, uh, Mr. Potocznik. Your interventions here in New York are, as uh, always, much appreciated and, and very insightful. Uh, we we uh, very much welcome an initiative such as this side event, which contribute to building momentum and creating awareness for the importance of promoting a circular economy, particularly in this crucial year where we will have so many opportunities to connect the dots, such as the upcoming high-level meeting on water, the Food Systems Summit, the high-level dialogue on energy, COP26, as well as COP15, and the negotiations around the post-2020 global bio biodiversity framework, um, which have already been mentioned. Uh, the concept of a circular economy becomes even more relevant in this year, uh, which will focus on building back better and building back greener. Austria is the co-chair of the Group of Friends of Inclusive and Sustainable Industrial Development, as you may know. So I just wanted to say a few words on the concept of circular economy from that perspective. We see the role of industrialization as one of the key enablers and catalysts for sustainable development and circular economy concepts are particularly relevant when it comes to industrial and manufacturing uh, systems improvement. The Industrial Development Report 2020, for instance, acknowledges that the new industrial revolution and advanced digital production technologies have the potential to increase energy and resource efficiency and further the transition to a circular economy. In our view, the linkages between Sustainable Development Goal 9 on sustainable industrialization and Sustainable Goal 12 on sustainable consumption and production, which aims at reducing future economic, environmental and social costs are key even more so when we look towards a sustainable post-COVID recovery. This is also true, of course, for Sustainable Development Goal 13 on combating climate change and so many other goals, of course. Uh, we very much look forward to remaining involved in hopefully many more discussions on the concept of circular economy, especially in this super year of nature. And as we are trying to build back better and accelerate prog progress on SDG implementation, in the context of the decade of action. I thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, contribution. Uh, let's now turn to Chad, please. Uh, thank you, uh, moderator. And uh, I would like to uh, congratulate Kenya, Singapore, and Netherlands for this um, initiative. And also thanks for giving us the opportunity to participate to this very um, interesting and important uh, topic. I uh, would like also to thank uh, Mr. Janis uh, Protonik for this uh, very important uh, statement and uh, also that he could share with us. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, to say just that my country is very interested and uh, we look um, very forward uh, into joining the, the initiative and to join the group. Um, but I would like to draw the attention in uh, maybe one or two points. At the level of um, the country and at the level of the citizen, I would like to say that um, countries like mine, I'm, I'm talking about Chad, we, are very, um, we feel like you 
are very uh, speedy and, and there are so many concepts, so many small groups uh, who are all very interesting. And uh, most of them are in English and the data are not sometimes very available or are um, say, uh, shared in a format that sometimes it is a little tight for people um, to be really proactive. And uh, this is one point. Another point I would like to say also that my government uh, joined most of the uh, global initiatives and uh, also uh, listed uh, some priorities in a term of um, reaching the goals 2030 and 2063 uh, for the African Union. Uh, and it's doing its job. But uh, we belong to an area which is very problematic. And uh, today uh, it is clearly said that the uh, link between um, the, 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 the climate change and the uh, pressure on the security in this area is, uh, is a reality. And, um, and people are, and countries are just uh, uh, trying to get the balance between uh, dealing with all the chain of problem, the certification, um, pressure on the, um, on the uh, resources and security and the youth. And I would like to uh, close my remark on this issue. Uh, today, the youth are very proactive and uh, they are really seeking for uh, windows to join the, this kind of initiative. So what could be done uh, um, and at the uh, level um, of the of the of the citizen that we could um, maybe give that opportunity to the youth to be really part of the the agenda to be really uh, actors in this field because it is a little tight and a little difficult till now to really join and to be uh, proactive. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm, without wanting to. Uh put you on this podcast here, I thought that you might have a reaction to, to those points. I saw, I saw you uh, writing notes frenetically. <laughs> yes, I, I, am, I am so grateful for, for those comments. And um, there's, there's um, a, a few things that come to mind. And, and the first is that you know, so much of what we do on climate and so much of what we do on, uh, on circular economy is so context specific. And we cannot really begin to unpack this without being very aware of the context in which this work is is happening. And, and as the ambassador was saying, and it's so eloquently about, you know, the, this decertification and, and security issues that are happening within a country are the context in which these initiatives will succeed or fail. And we need, as a global community, I think, need to be able to help countries where they're at. Um, and certainly with, with, with UNDP, you know, we, we are doing a, a, we've got a partnership with, with UNEP um, about a, a sustainable consumption and production um, hotspot analysis. We are working with countries in the climate promise to be able to do this, but I, I really can't emphasize this enough about really needing to be able to, um, uh, to be able to take all of these considerations about what manufacturing looks like, what plastics looks like, what job creation looks like. Um, as the ambassador said about youth as well, um, you know, what future generations think about this, really being able to have both feet on the ground uh, when it comes to these. Um, I also do wanna, wanna make a, a point about um, the concepts being speedy and language often being the English. That, and I think for, for anyone that, that follows also the UNFCCC negotiations, that is such a key issue. Um, if we really want to move forward together, we need to make sure everyone is together. And, and, and this means being able to have things in multiple languages. It means being able to, uh, to have support for countries that are often the most vulnerable to, to these impacts and where things like circular economy can play such an important role. So, um, so yes, you, you saw me scribbling, um, but these, these were the, the pieces that, that really came to mind and I, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the intervention. Thank you very much, Cassie. There was a question in the chat for the Global Alliance, but I see that mm -hmm. uh, our colleague uh, Luca from the European Commission has addressed this. I would now like to give the floor to Bangladesh. I thank you very much, uh, 
Mr. Chair, for giving me the floor. And uh, I must thank uh, EU delegation, uh, the delegation from Singapore, Kenya, and uh, Netherlands and Finland for organizing this very important event on circular economy. I would have three specific points to make. And first point that I would like to make is on norms creation. I think this has come through the deliberation of IRP. And we understand the value of creating norms both within UN and across governments and societies to put or place the issue of circular economy at, uh, at in, in, in a more important platform. But when it comes to norms creation, I think uh, it's also uh, very important to have a sort of circular partnership because you know norms creation is not very easy. So here, my observation would be, how do we think we can engage with uh, all the partners uh, across societies and governments to make sure that the norms creation has enough traction across different uh, stakeholders. My second point is, of course, value creation. And uh, I would refer back to the comments made by ASG Selvin Hart and also ambassadors of, uh, of Netherlands and, and Singapore who have uh, placed enough importance on engaging with uh, of the role of governments and of course, uh, private sector. But what we feel most important is to engage with the scientific communities. And in many other contexts, I think it's also important how do we integrate the indigenous uh, innovations that are there in, in many countries. So in Bangladesh, for example, you know, there are so many indigenous solutions, particularly in our coastal belts, when it comes to uh, utilize or reutilize or recycle the resources that we have or how to manage livelihood within the limited resources that we have in a particular context. So there are a lot to learn. And uh, I think uh, coming back from the uh, intervention of the ambassador of Chad, it's really important to build on those and create platforms through South-South cooperation so that we can actually leverage the innovations that we have in in, in our indigenous societies and, and, and build on those. So this is the second point that I wanted to make and that is on value creation. And my third point is transformative partnership. So for a circular economy to be su successful, it's important that the partnership that we have is also circular or, 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 or transformative. And to that, I would uh, like to stress on two issues. One is technology transfer and the second one is knowledge transfer. Because unless we are able to share technologies in a circular way and we can, cannot leverage the technological advances that are coming in, uh, especially through 4IR and other platforms, actually we will not be able to integrate uh, the people who are farthest behind, especially uh, in, in, in countries uh, like uh, uh, which, are, which are most vulnerable, for example, LDCs and other vulnerable countries. So this is very important, technology transfer and knowledge transfer. So these are the three points that I wanted to make. One is, uh, of course, uh, uh, norms creation. Second one is value creation. And the third one is transformative or circular partnership. I thank you once again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much for these points. I'm just uh, turning to uh, Cassie, Gonzalo, or Yanis, any quick reactions to what has been said? And also, there's a question in the chat from uh, Dominic Hogg regarding the uh, emissions inventories. Uh, so maybe try to either uh, address all of this in, in one single statement or, or take it in turns. Who would like to go first? because then we'll need to move to the conclusion part of the uh, event, unfortunately. I think Jocelyn, if, if, if I may come in just for a quick, a quick reaction um, uh, from, from the comments from our, our, our colleague from Bangladesh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think there's also the, this idea I, I, I want to touch on is, is this technology transfer. Um, certainly within the context of the climate promise, we have about 
70% of our countries say that they want to enhance uh, mitigation ambition. And we have about uh, a 97% that want to enhance uh, adaptation ambition. And what's interesting about this is the role of technology in both. Um, and, and thinking about how technologies can be uh, adopted in particular contexts, how they can be uh, sort of disseminated and how sort of access to this knowledge and, and, and um, our, our colleague mentioned the, the South-South collaboration importance, that this is certainly something that we are seeing that I think can really help to, um, help to equip countries with, with what they need when it comes to circular economy, once they've been able to make that, that sort of political commitment um, to be able to help deliver this um, at the speed that, that they need to deliver it. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for being uh, brief. Uh, Yanis or, or Gonzalo, we have uh, a minute and a half left before we move on. So if you'd like quick reactions, it's now. Yeah, just one sentence. Uh, the thing which actually you have discussed, it's a link to the just transition. I think it is uh, utmost important to understand that transition, which we normally talk about in environmental context, will actually fly on fall or fall on the just transition and social part of the transition. So the things are very much interlinked and we have to deal with both transitions simultaneously or we will fail. Thank you very much, Yanis. Gonzalo, I saw you open your well, mind. Yes, very, very rapidly. Um, my, my, my reflection is how much of circular economy offers a language that can facilitate most of those characteristics of, that I need to implement in different regions and different sectors. So at the end, what I see is once you position the language and the narrative of circular economy, climate action is a consequence. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. And I suggest that we take the, the question from Dominic Hogg in the chat and, uh, and take it offline and try to think about this and come up with an answer. We can liaise with him in the, uh, in the aftermath. Uh, now for the closing remarks, I would like to go to Ambassador Yuka Sarovara from uh, Finland, permanent representative of Finland to the UN, could, to give his thoughts on what he heard and what Finland might want to do going forward. Well, uh, thank you so much and thank you all for attending the event today and thank you for the uh, lively uh, discussion. Uh, as we have heard, uh, climate uh, and biodiversity targets can only be achieved if we change the way we consume and, and produce co commodities and services. We must really rethink the way our economies work and move from individual technologies and solutions to uh, pursuing a, a systemic change which looks at the whole society and different interconnections. Uh, the environmental benefits of a circular economy are clear. However, we have to admit that systemic change is also disruptive. Our societies and economies need to evolve and phase out certain activities, but this doesn't mean that the economy collapses, it transforms. We just need to make sure that, that we harness the potential of the circular economy to create new types of uh, employment and uh, entrepreneurship. So green growth is, is not jobless growth. Finland actively promotes the circular economy, both domestically and internationally. In 2016, we launched our first circular economy roadmap with the leadership of the Finnish innovation uh, fund Citra that was also referred to earlier. The first World Circular Economy Forum was organized in Finland in 2017 in Helsinki and then again in 2019. We are just finalizing a new strategic circular economy program. The program's aim is to transform our economy into one that is based on the principles of circular economy by 2035. This is also a key step towards achieving climate neutrality by 2035. Uh, Finland has worked consistent, consistently to promote sustainable consumption and production and circular economy at mul multilateral for forums like the United Nations Environment uh, Assembly, in UN programs and networks, such as the Partnership for Action on Green Economy and the One Planet Network and the World Trade Organization. I, I want to uh, wrap up my remarks today with a very uh, practical example. 
uh, Finland has taken a lead in the uh, development of battery recycling in Europe by the request of the European Commission. A new pilot project is uh, underway with the goal of recovering as much of the battery ma materials as possible for the use of battery manufacturing in a financial, financially viable manner and thus integrating recycling and initial production. Uh, battery production is a good example of a bottleneck sector, which is crucial for the electrification and at the same time decarbonization of traffic. But at the same time, we have to find sustainable and circular solutions in their production. Uh, I really hope that uh, today's event will inspire many others to take the lead on promoting similar practical solutions uh, to making a, a circular uh, economy a reality. But many thanks for, to everyone for sort of a good discussion and, and your dedication and participation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, which brings uh, the discussion to a close. I think we've heard an awful lot of really interesting perspectives on the way that circular economy is weaving itself into the climate discussion, into the biodiversity discussion, and really establishing itself as a global solution framework for some of the most pressing challenges, whilst also delivering on the, the need for ushering in a, a new wave of prosperity based on, on building capital, social, economic, and environmental, rather than uh, depleting it. Uh, it is our pleasure to have been asked to uh, host this uh, session, uh, moderate this session, co-hosted by the EU delegation, but all the Netherlands, Singapore, and Kenya and Finland. Uh, we are uh, trying to bring our contribution to that discussion by uh, contributing a paper on the universal circular economy policy goals, which is a, a big statement. But the idea is really to say, for countries that want to embark on this transition and don't necessarily know where to start, we have a set of five key policy areas to look into in order to create alignment and, and a common narrative. Because as the ambassador reminded us, system change is, is disruptive. The fact is that at the moment, the system is hardwired for and by linearity. And that systemic change will only happen through a really close dialogue between private and public sector, and also a close look at the structural reforms that are needed in order to get there and to make the economics work for a circular economy. I'd like to close now. Thank you very much. Uh, I will remind participants that the, uh, the session will be available for catch up on the EU, EU delegation YouTube channel after the session. And I'm very much looking forward to pursuing that discussion throughout the year and for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.